Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Now I'd like to invite you all to turn to Revelation 2.25, our scripture this morning. Revelation 2.25. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word and those that hear and believe it. Now we have one. All right, if you can, let us kneel for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come here to your house of worship to learn of thee and your Son. Father, I pray that you will grant us your spirit as we open your word. Help us not only to learn, but to apply that which we will be hearing and reading. We thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, I'm not sure if everyone who is given the task to speak finds it a challenge. <laughs> but I know that oftentimes um, what comes through my mind is a question. And that question is, what else does the people of God need to hear that they haven't heard? That's the question that I usually hear in my mind. So in this presentation, um, first of all, not that other, my other presentations are not for me, but I believe that this one is for me. Um, and you will know why as we um, move forward in our presentation. But as you can see, the title is to stand firm in Jehovah. And so that's what we need to keep in mind. We need to treasure this in our hearts as we um, are in these last days. So let us begin with our first passage of Scripture, which reads, But that which ye have already hold... I'm sorry, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. So this is pertaining to something we, that we already have. And that which we have, we are counseled to hold till I come. We need not say the perils of the last days are soon to come upon us. Already they have what? They have come. We need now the sword of the Lord to cut to the very soul of marrow and fleshly lusts, appetites, and passions. Do you agree with this statement? That we don't have to say the pearls of the last days are soon to come, but in fact, they are here already. What do you say? And because they are here, we are to cut the fleshly lusts, appetites, and passions, those, of course, that are not in union with God's counsel. And then we are told, a storm is coming, relentless in its fury, are we prepared to meet it? That's a solemn question. Are we prepared to meet it? Are we prepared to meet this relentless fury? You could only answer that question. Trials? How many are going through trials? Perhaps in your family, sicknesses, loss of a job, whatever the case may be, that's a trial that you are going um, through. How about um, have you been rejected because of what you believe? Have you been rejected? Have you have former friends stopped talking to you because of what you believe? Have you lost family members?
for the same reason, even closer to home, like a spouse, a son, or a daughter. It happens. It happens all the time. So if, you, that, if this hasn't happened to you, consider that a blessing. All this compared to what is coming, even though in your mind you might feel that it's huge, in which I don't want to uh, make it seem like it's not, because I know it's a difficult trial, but compared to what is coming, it is small. We also have the following Bible question, which is registered in Revelation. Notice what it reads. For the great day of his wrath is come, and the question is, who shall be able to stand? Who is going to be able to stand in that day of his wrath? What do we need to stand? What is going to take us to meet the storm, not only to meet it, but to be able to endure it? What is it going to take? The mind of Christ. That's what it's going to take. The mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, we are told, which was also where? And where in whom? In Christ Jesus. Was Jesus rejected by friends? By society? By church members? Even by those who profess to follow him? The following account um, displays the state of mind that Jesus possessed while he lived here on earth. And I chose this account for that purpose. I'm sure we're very familiar with this account, but let's, let's read through it. This is when Jesus was in that storm. Notice what we, we read here. When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, what was his attitude? What was his state of mind? He was what? In perfect peace. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. There was no trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was where? In his heart. But he rested not in the possession of almighty power. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what I understand. That the reason why he was in perfect peace and there was no trace of fear in word or in look, it's not because he rested in possession of almighty power. That's not the reason. Amen. So what was the reason? Let's keep reading. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet or in peace. That power he had laid down, and he says, I can of my own self do nothing. Now notice. He trusted in the Father's might. He did what? He trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith. Faith in what? Faith in God's love and care. That Jesus rested. And the power of that word which still the storm was the power of God. That, that's the reason why Jesus was at peace. Because he trusted in the Father's might. He had faith, faith in God's love and care. Do we have that? But why do we despair or become anxious? If that is the case, it's because we don't trust in the Father's might. We don't trust that there's a way out of our circumstances. We need to be reminded of these things. But what we need to do is treasure these things, treasure these sayings, because if we don't treasure God's word in our heart, we will what? We will sin. We will sin. So we need to treasure God's word in our hearts. How about his disciples? What was the attitude or the mental attitude of his disciples during this occasion? We are told they rushed to him 
and bending over his prostrate form, cry out reproachfully, Master, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Their hearts are grieved that he should rest so peacefully, while danger and death threaten them. And they have been laboring so hard against the fury of the storm, this despairing cry arouses Jesus from his refreshing sleep. So notice that they approach him, how? Reproachfully. Because he's at rest, he's at peace. And here we are in the face of death. How can you be at peace or be sleeping through this storm? As the disciples rush back to their oars to make a last effort, Jesus rises to his feet. In his divine majesty, he stands in the humble vessel of the fishermen. Amid the raging of the tempest, the waves breaking over the bows, and the vivid light, lightning playing about his calm and fearless countenance. This is what the disciples were experiencing. Now notice, he lifts his hand, so often employed in deeds of mercy, and says to the angry, angry sea, Peace, be still. The storm ceases, the heaven billows sink to rest, the clouds roll away, and the stars shine forth. The boat sits motionless upon a quiet sea. Then, turning to his disciples, Jesus does what? Rebukes them, saying, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have Little faith? No faith. Why are ye so faithful? He rebukes them. Who wants to be rebuked after a crisis of this sort? No one does. But he rebukes them. Why are ye so faithful? Fearful. How is it that you have no faith? This is the mind, the faith of Jesus that we must all possess if we expect to endure not only what's going on today, but the current coming storm. We're going to need the mind of Christ. And as, as, as we are organizing here, um, the storms come in many different ways to deter us. Would you agree? To discourage us from moving forward. There's one prophecy, and I've mentioned it before. We've touched on quite a few prophetic events. But there's one also that this one pertains to the movings or activities of the people of God. And that is registered in the book of Revelation, chapter 18 under that mighty angel which illuminates the earth with its glory. And this is the movement that will finish the work, we are told. But Satan has ways to deter this from happening. How so? Well, he brings storms of winds of what? Doctrine, unfortunately. As we move forward in the organization process, the devil will bring in falsehoods to deter the body. We must, like never before, be sure that our feet are planted on solid ground. We must all be sure of that. You cannot rely on what I say or anyone else says. You must be a faithful Berean and test everything by the word of God. Remember the sealed ones, the servants of God, the 144,000? What are we told? They cannot be what? Moved. They are settled into the truth, both spiritually and intellectually. So let's touch a little on, on some accounts of uh, Scripture that the apostles as well had to endure or they um, experienced. Notice here, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, 
which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Of course, this had its historical context, but the point I'm sharing this is because they too experienced um, storms of uh, winds of doctrine blowing in their midst. Here we have, for as much as we have heard that certain uh, which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. So who is this coming from? Who is this coming from? Where are they he hearing these concepts? From who? Notice, from them which went out from us. Not from strangers, but from them who were at one time part of the body. Nothing new under the sun. Would you agree? Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Now this is interesting because notice that divisions rise, arise from teaching contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. That's what the scripture here says. From the doctrine which ye have learned. And this appears to give no room for new teachings, which are labeled new light. The issue with many teachings today is that many of these contradict the teachings which God has already approved. New light will never teach contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. New light will never contradict the old. Otherwise, if it does, the old so-called light was never light. Think about it. It was never light. God is light. In Him there is no darkness. Right? So if anything we hold as light, it must be true. It must be true. For they that are such... For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. How do they do that? With good words and fair speeches. They speak well. They're um, not only intellectual, what's the other word? When they're not char well, charismatic is one. Um, I guess I'm not forgetting there. It's the way they deliver their message. And I can't remember the word. Persuasive. Persuasive. Very eloquent. Eloquent. And they're speaking. And the simple ones in heart, they fall for these deceptions. Those who follow their own mind and walk in their own way will form crooked characters. We can have, we cannot afford to walk in our own mind. We must have the mind of Christ. Vain doctrines and subtle sentiments, we are told, will be introduced with plausible presentations to deceive if possible, the very elect. What does plausible mean? Plausible means feasible, believable, seeming reasonable, and that's why people embrace them. But these teachings, if you analyze them, they are lacking a thus saith the Lord. It's a faulty conclusion that is not found in Scripture or the spirit of prophecy. We need to be careful. We read, the storm is coming, the storm that will try every man's faith of what sort it is. Believers must now be firmly rooted in Christ, or else they will be led astray by some face of error. 
Let your faith be substantiated by the word of God. Grasp firmly the living testimony of truth. Have faith in Christ as a personal Savior. He has been and ever will be our rock of ages. Amen. Change not your faith for what? For any phase of doctrine, however pleasing it may appear, that will seduce the soul. There are pleasing doctrines out there. We are told, give heed to them. Give no heed to them. Don't be um, listening to these uh, falsehoods. The fallacies of Satan are now being multiplied. And those who swerve from the path of truth will lose their bearings. Have, having nothing to which to anchor, they will drift from one delusion to another, blown about the winds of strange doctrines. Another word for strange is foreign. Something that you don't recognize. You're not, you're not familiar with. They're foreign doctrines, strange doctrines. We are not to give heed to these uh, teachings. And notice also, they will drift from one delusion to another. They start off believing one thing, and before you know, they're believing, it's like they're scaling an error. And I have witnessed this myself and other people. And it's very sad, unfortunately. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand, how? Fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We need to be of what? One spirit, one mind. For what purpose? To strive together for the faith. What do you say? Isn't that a challenge? But this is what we need to strive for. To be united. To be one in spirit. One in mind. Striving together for the faith. This is what we need to experience. Because we have a purpose our purpose is not to begin just another church. Do you believe that? Our purpose is to accomplish the work that God has given to us. And that is the proclamation of the third angel's message to all the inhabitants of the world so that Jesus can come. That is our purpose. Notice this statement here. Angels are now restraining the winds of strife that they may not blow until when? Until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels lose the winds, now notice the following, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. That's horrible. As no pen can picture. We haven't seen nothing yet. And we've seen some horrific things, have we not? But she says here that no pen can picture. Serious. So the world needs to be warned of its coming doom. And as we work following God's instructions, He will bless us with His Holy Spirit as He has promised. We need to Submit to his instructions. What do you say? Even if they are hard, we must submit to them because he is God. When we have worship at home this week, we were talking about um, what took place in heaven. And that spirit that Satan, uh, Lucifer, had, he began to question why things were arranged the way they were. Why couldn't I be in the councils with God, as was Jesus? That is not fair. Why, cannot, 
I be part of those councils? Simple. Because the sovereign God has arranged it so. Submit. Accept it. He was unwilling to accept that. He became jealous of Christ. And he had to convict, um, bring all the angelic host and explain to them that the reason why Jesus was in this, those councils was because Jesus is my son, my begotten son. Oftentimes we too, we question, well, why this? Well, why that? I'm not saying questioning is wrong, but we should be willing to submit to inspiration. What do you say? I like this passage here. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. And nothing terrified. Which is to them an evident token of perdition. But to you of salvation and that of God. So in nothing be terrified. Don't be afraid of what's coming. God will take care of you. Now is the time for God's people to show themselves true to principle. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our seal be the warmest and, the, and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. That is now. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness. When how many forsake us? When the majority forsake us. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time, we must gather warm from the coldness of others. Are people cold? Well, we, mu we must gather warm from their coldness. Courage from their cowardice. Are people afraid? Are they cowards to stand for the truth? Well, we must get courage from that. And loyalty from their treason. Has the movement betrayed the truths of the past? Well, we must gather from that treason loyalty. But notice what will be our test. What will be our test? When champions are few, this will be our test. Do you like to stand with the crowd? Do you feel more comfortable standing with the crowd or standing by yourself? If you feel more comfortable standing with the crowd, then start praying about that. Because you might have to stand alone. Literally, alone. Here's a few promises um, from Scripture. Jehovah is on my side. Amen. I will not fear. What can man do? Do unto me. Jehovah is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Jehovah is the strength or the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I, even I, this is God speaking, I am he that comforts you or comforteth you, who art thou? That thou shouldest be afraid of man that shall die. In other words, why should you be afraid of mortal man? Why should you? And of the son of man which shall be made as grass, or of a son of man who will wither like green grass. There's no reason for us to be afraid of mortal man. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. These promises need to be registered in our mind so that we can endure what is coming and even endure our trials today. Are we waiting for the deliverance of God's people? 
we can learn something from how God delivered his people in the past. Deliverance in battle formation. In battle formation as a military, as an army. Notice. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest peradventure that people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. So God knew where he was directing his people. He knew if they would foresee war or terror, that might have an effect upon them. So he gave them directions. But God led the people about by the way of the wilderness, by the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up armed out of the land of Egypt. Now, this is from the American Standard Version, but what I understand from being army, you could do a little bit more of research on this, as a military. You might question what kind of weapons did they bring out of Egypt. Perhaps none. But they were in that formation. And it was because the captain of Jehovah's host or armies was leading them. And who's that captain? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Now when the children of God were surrounded by the Moabites and the Ammonites, and war was on the horizon, this is what we find in that account. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jil, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of Jehovah in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus said Jehovah unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Don't be afraid of this great crowd. Don't be afraid. Because the battle is not yours. It's mine. What a beautiful thing to hear. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeril. So here we have God is giving them directions, although this is my battle, you have a part to play in it. Now this is God's battle today. Would you agree? But do we as God's people have a play or a role in that battle? Yes. And we must follow, again, those directions. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of Jehovah with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for Jehovah will be with you. Go, don't be afraid. I will be with you, is what is God is telling them. He repeats it a number of times. Don't be afraid. He knows mankind, right? He knows mankind. He knows how frail we are. And so therefore he reminds us, don't be afraid. I am with you. I am with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before Jehovah, worshiping Jehovah. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise Jehovah God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, Believe in Jehovah your God, so shall ye be established. Believe what? His prophets, so shall ye prosper. 
There's something interesting about this. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto Jehovah that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, Praise Jehovah, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, why did the children of Israel, Judah, and everyone went forth? Why? Because they had a prophet. And they listened to that counsel that was given. And we, too, have the writings of a prophet. That's why we are told to what? Believe his prophets. There's a statement that I've been looking for. I haven't been able to find it. I believe it was from pioneer Stephen Haskell. He says, and I'm paraphrasing, that the test upon the world that is coming is a Sabbath test. But there's a test in his estimation that will come to the people of God. And you know what that test is? The writings of Sister White. The spirit of prophecy. People are being tested today on the spirit of prophecy. Because when the spirit of prophecy says something, there is nowhere to, nowhere to go. Either we believe in the testimony or we reject it. Either we believe that she was inspired or we don't. I don't believe her writings are a buffet where I can take some and reject others. So I hope that you don't believe in that manner. So again, believe his prophets, we are told, and ye shall prosper. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the front, forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy, for Jehovah had made them to rejoice over their enemies. Are we going to be part of that class that will rejoice over our enemies? I pray that every one of us here will be a part of that class. So I pray that this has been an encouragement to every single one of you. As you are going and, you know, you're living your life. And as you're going through trials and things are predicted to get worse, don't be afraid. Treasure these promises in your mind and in your heart, and keep them with you at all times. And God will keep you. God will keep you. He has promised. Be loyal. That's the covenant that you make with him. If we obey, he will keep us. He will keep us. We have a part to play. We must be obedient servants of the living God. So with that, I'm going to invite those that can to kneel so that we can end with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the accounts of Scripture and the spirit of prophecy through the writings of Sister White. We thank you for the accounts of Scripture how your people, when they um, accepted your promises and believed in your word, they prosper and they experience uh, triumph over their enemies. Father, help us to also be obedient. Help us to be submissive to your word. Help us to not be afraid. Help us to have the same mental attitude that Christ Jesus, your son, had. And this is possible by treasuring your sayings in our heart. Help us, dear Father, to 
on a daily basis when we read to memorize these promises, to keep them in our heart every day, all day, until Jesus comes. And we thank you and we pray in his name. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth. 